parable of the Good Samaritan. <coughs> Pardon my croaky voice. <clears throat> On one occasion, an expert, expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? Jesus replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he travelled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law. Reply, he replied, the one who had mercy in him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Thank you, Linda. Paul, would you like to come up now? I'll just pray for you, Paul, before you give us the word. Lord, we just thank you for Paul as our minister and as our friend. And Lord, we just thank you for all that he's prepared this morning so that we may hear exactly what you want to say to us. And we just pray blessing on him, Lord, as he delivers those words to us. And I pray that they will go deep in our hearts. And when we leave this place, we will be changed in some way because of the words that you've had spoken to us. So, Lord, bless Paul as he speaks now. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Zay. It was a dark and stormy night. A man and his wife were fast asleep in bed when they were suddenly woken up by the sound of a car outside their house. <clears throat> a couple of minutes later, there came this really loud knock on the door. A man looked at his phone and he saw it was three o'clock in the morning. Who on earth can that be at this time of the day? Outside, the wind was howling and the rain was pelting against the window. The knocking on the door, it continued. It grew louder and it became more and more persistent. Go down and see who it is, said his wife. So, reluctantly, the man put on his dressing gown, went downstairs. At the bottom, he froze. Through the frosty glass of the front door, he could see this huge shadow looming in the porchway. With a shaking hand, he reached out and he opened the door. And there, in the pouring rain, stood a tall, dark figure of a man, someone he'd never seen before. He had a hood pulled down over his eyes, and there was a vivid scar running down his cheek. 
can you give me a push? The stranger asked. I'm sorry, I can't, said the man. It's three in the morning. With that, he slammed the door. He ran back upstairs and jumped back into bed. Who was it? said his wife. I don't know, just some really creepy looking bloke looking for a push, he answered. Did you help him? No way, said the man. It's three in the morning. It's raining cats and dogs out there. You should be ashamed of yourself, said his wife. Remember that time when we broke down in the middle of nowhere? Two strangers came and helped us. We would have been stuck there all night if it hadn't been for them. I think you should go and help. With a deep sigh, the man got back out of bed, put his dressing gown back on, went downstairs and opened the door. It was pitch black, the wind was still blowing again, Gail and the rain was still lashing down. Peering out into the darkness, the man shouted, Hey, are you still there? From somewhere nearby, he heard a voice, Yes, I am. Do you still want a push, he shouted. Yes, please, came the reply. So stepping out into the darkness and into the pouring rain, he looked, couldn't see the man, so he shouted, Where are you? Over here on your swing, the stranger replied. (laughs) A tongue-in-cheek story about someone who wanted help. Whereas there is nothing tongue-in-cheek about the story we've read together. The Good Samaritan is probably one of the best known of Jesus' parables, even for those who've never been to church or over-opened up a Bible. The man who's gone on a journey through what was a dangerous area, he's beaten up, robbed, left at the side of the road, half dead. He didn't want help. He was in desperate need of help. It's often been used to remind us of our moral duty to help those who need help. And that's fair enough. That's okay. But what Jesus wanted his listeners to understand went much deeper than that. There are shed loads of books that have been written on Jesus' parables. And never mind what all the various commentaries have to say. But in the world of theological study and interpretation, this book is considered to be possibly the single most detailed study. It is quoted time and time again by other writers. It's a lightweight little number of only 892 pages. It looks at what parables are, the parables that existed in the, in the ancient world because they weren't just the parables of Jesus, then the way we can group the parables together, such as the parables about money, the kingdom, and the ones that Hugh looked at last week, what are called the parables about lostness. The parable of the Good Samaritan, you may be surprised to know, comes under the category of discipleship parables. It's a really helpful book, as it approaches every parable from the same direction, looking at things like what sort of parable it is, other writings that relate to it from its day, the cultural issues, how to interpret it. explanations, the thoughts of other writers, its application for us. And then finally, if you haven't had your fill by then, it gives you a list of other books you can read on the subject. Don't worry, we're not about to debate whether this particular parable is allegorical or metaphorical or any other forical that we might want to apply to it. But as a book, what this has done for me is encouraged me to read the parables in a different way. 
and to see things perhaps that I'd missed before. When we think of Jesus, he wasn't just a master storyteller. He was a very, very clever one. We can see this in the way he deals with this expert in the law who stands up to test him. What must I do to inherit eternal life, he asks. Jesus could have answered. But he turns it around instead and answers, asks his own question. How do you read what's written in the law? And that forces the man to answer for himself. Love God and neighbour. And only then does Jesus answer the original question. Do this and you will live. But the conversation doesn't end there. Now it seems a man wants to justify himself, so he comes up with another question. Who is my neighbour? Jesus does the same thing again. Who proved to be the neighbour in the parable, he asks the man, the one who showed mercy. Jesus answers, go and do the same then. As a story, it's not going to have the impact on us that it would have done to those listening to the conversation at the time. Anyone local to the area listening to Jesus would have been able to relate to what he was saying, as would all the Jewish listeners as this story unfolded. It begins with the crime scene and our near dead victim. The area was known to be frequented by robbers. There were lots of places where it would be possible to ambush someone. And then we have the priest, then the Levite, and finally the Samaritan. All people who would have been known to the listeners. They would have been able to picture that scene in a way that we can't. And it's quite possible they may have wondered if Jesus was telling a true story. It's a story in which three travellers see the injured man. But for the priest and the Levite, what they see leads them to just exercise caution and self-protection. Whereas Samaritan... What he sees generates compassion and a desire to do what he can to help. The two love commands sat at the heart of Judaism and with the foundation of Jesus' ministry. No Jew would have argued with the Lord about to love, the need to love God and to love their neighbour. But how far were they expected to go? In telling this story, what Jesus wanted was for his listeners to understand that there should be no boundaries when it comes to providing help. Jesus was tearing down the barriers of race, religion, law, and reminding his listeners of what love for God and love for neighbour truly meant. That legal expert, he'd already shown he understood the need to love God in every way and that he had to love his neighbour. But knowing that and doing that were very different, as the priests and the Levite show us. They would have had the same understanding of what the law required of them, same as the legal expert. But it's seen that they allowed different rules to govern what they did. The priest and the Levite, they come across the man lying as good as dead in the road. They're not getting involved. And they say they give him as wide a berth as possible by crossing over and passing by on the other side. They may have believed the man to be dead. But they couldn't possibly have known for sure. But they're not taking a chance. 
For them, the need to avoid being defiled by contact with a dead body is more important than showing love and care. And they could have even argued, if challenged, that what they were doing was what their rabbinic law told them to do. Because in that law, there was the command to keep at least six feet distance from a dead body. But what they would also known from their own laws, that they were required on religious grounds to bury a neglected corpse, regardless of who the person may have been. In their day, to be denied burial was the most hum humiliating indignity that could be inflicted on the dead, as it meant to become food for beasts of prey. And then on top of this, most Jews, not all, but most, would not have allowed anything, not even the purity laws, to stand in the way of saving life. Regardless of whether they truly thought he was dead or not, they had a duty to act, either by burying the body, even if that meant being defiled, or going to his aid. Now, Jesus' choice of a Samaritan to drive home his point must have really challenged those Jewish listeners. The very least, it would have been really embarrassing for them. Samaritans were viewed as being a people of dubious descent, and their theology was very doubtful. Their relationships with the Jews were, to put it mildly, not very good. The priests, the Levites, they knew what the law required of them. But it's a hated Samaritan who stops and shows what they mean. This man was moved to help the stranger when he saw him. He took pity on him. He didn't just ignore what, what was there in front of him, as so many people do today, as you explained yourself, Tay. He didn't cross the road to avoid what was there. No, he chose to see the need that was there in front of him. And that's what our Lord does. He sees the need. There are many examples in the Bible where we see the love and compassion that Jesus had for people who were suffering. And if we love God, then we should have that same compassion. When we see those who are hurt, alone, lost, indeed anyone who needs help, then our hearts should be touched and moved. But it wasn't enough to simply see the need to feel sorry. He chose to do something. It's one thing to have faith, to believe in God, but it doesn't, if it doesn't make us want to help, then something is missing from our faith. The Bible tells us this man, he went to him. <coughs> he sees the injured man, he just springs into action. I'm sure we've all seen and been moved, made to feel sad by things we've seen on the news. Maybe we've heard a very sad story. Or we know someone who's having a particularly difficult time. It could be someone in our family, it could be a friend, or it could be a complete stranger. But it's not enough to just feel sorry. We need to be like the Samaritan. And if we can, do something about it. And that's what he did. He went and bandaged the, injured man, bandaged the injured man's wounds, pouring on oil and wine. But he didn't just patch him up. He didn't just administer first aid. He puts him on his donkey, 
takes him to an inn where he then continued to take care of him. And not only did he do that, but he then paid extra to provide care that might be needed and then promised to pay more on his return if that wasn't enough. When we love God with all our strength, we'll be prepared to do whatever it takes, no matter how hard it might be or what it might cost us. One of the reasons I joined the police was because I wanted to help people and to try and make a difference in their lives. God always encouraged me to do the best I could, which for me often meant doing more than I had to or going doing the things that were particularly challenging that people didn't want to do. But in doing that, so often I would see the difference it made to those I was trying to help. And I'm sure that would have been the experience for this injured man in our story. When his wounds started to heal, I wonder what he felt, how he felt for the one who helped him. Jericho in the Lord's Day was so popular with priests, it's estimated that half of the 24 orders of priests lived there. So it's very likely that our victim was a Jew. We also know he was naked, so his clothing would have given no clues at all. The Samaritan didn't care. Didn't bother him that this man was almost certainly a Jew. Didn't bother him that this was someone who almost certainly would have hated him. Wasn't bothered by their differences, just wanted to help. Didn't matter where he came from, the different religious beliefs, what anybody else may have thought of what he was doing. He wasn't even bothered about the personal risk to himself stopping on this road. All he saw was a need in front of him and he knew he could do something to help. When we love God with all our hearts, then just like that man did, we will be prepared to help no matter who that person is, we are helping. Even if we know it's someone who doesn't like us. I said earlier that this parable is one of the discipleship parables, but I didn't explain why. It's quite simple, really. Discipleship for a Christian is the process of becoming more like Christ in everything we do. And in this parable, Jesus wants us to do what he would do. He wants us to show that love for God and for our neighbour means there are no boundaries when it comes to offering help. Even if it's towards those we may see as our enemies or those we know hate us. This parable speaks directly into what we've seen going on in Israel and Gaza. It's a parable that leaves no room for prejudice, racism, sexism, homophobia, religious intolerance, or anything like that. Our neighbour is not just the person who lives in the house next to us, but anyone and everyone. And to be a neighbour means being prepared to help them, whoever they may be. If all of us if we all, as a humanity, loved God and neighbour in the way Jesus calls us to, our world would be a very different place. And that's why it's so important that we live out the example 
that Jesus has set us, no matter how hard that can be at times. That's what it truly means to love God and to love our neighbour. Amen. Lord, we thank you for, again, the stories that you have told. It's probably one of the best known of your stories. But as I've just said, Lord, what a different world this would be if we truly obeyed those commands. And so we hold this parable up as an example. We pray into this parable, Lord, that through your spirit we may, throughout your creation, learn what it truly means to love you and to love our neighbour and to live it out. You told this story 2,000 years ago to a group of Jewish listeners. Perhaps you could tell this story again to your people today. Help those in the lands that you once walked to remember what you said it means to love God and to love your neighbour. Pray this parable over your creation, Lord. Amen.